This is your reminder that the BBC has yet to address the consistent transphobic leanings in its news coverage. And while the team behind Doctor Who is not connected to this in any way, since this is a BBC-owned property, I'm going to keep pointing it out until the problem gets resolved. Links in a pinned comment below if you don't know what I'm talking about. I'll stop saying it when it stops being a problem. Okay, but which of the specials is truly special? Well, folks, we're in the new year. We've had the Doctor Who specials, quite a few of them. We got this last year. And uh, we aren't going to be getting new Doctor Who until May. So what's a fan to do? Well, rank the specials, of course. Not just the ones that came out, but like all of them. Although not all of them. I'll explain in a minute. I'm actually shocked I've never done this before, but I haven't. So here we go. I am going to be attempting to rank all of the specials of the modern era of Doctor Who. There were some specials back in classic, although which things count as specials and which things just happen to fall on anniversaries gets a little bit odd, and I didn't feel like trying to parse all that when it comes to classic. Maybe eventually when I update this, I'll do that by integrating classic back into it. For this time, at least, I'm not going to be doing that. The other thing I want to be clear about is no shorts are going to be counted. So nothing like Night of the Doctor, Time Crash, none of those kinds of things. Those are smaller uh, sort of supplementary stuff. I may eventually do a ranking of the modern era supporting shorts and one-off kind of things like that, but those are not being included. And also, this is not limited to specials that are centered around a specific holiday or event. Instead, I'm going to try and cover all of them. So that means all of the New Year's specials, the Christmas specials, the anniversary specials, basically any episode that is a full episode that did not fall within the confines of a proper series of Doctor Who. So when you look at what episodes are included in series 1 through 12 and also Flux, whatever doesn't fall into those specific series runs, that is counting as a special. For the way that I have decided to do this, there's 25 of these to go through. We got a ways to go. We're going to start at the bottom, work our way up. Let's get started with number 25, The Legend of the Sea Devils. Yeah, this one's, this was just kind of nothing. The thing is, I don't, I don't hate it. I mean, if this is the worst ranked one and I'm saying I don't hate it, then obviously I don't really hate any of them. But this is the one that just has the least substance to it. There is nothing going on here that feels like a special. Honestly, even for a standard episode, this feels absolutely aggressively mediocre. Not really bad, but just kind of meh, very ephemeral. It's probably worth noting at this point because it'll come up later. I'm not really going to be factoring in like how much does it... Uh, you know, really emphasize the specifics of the special, like how Christmassy is it if it's a Christmas special? How celebratory of the show is it if it's an anniversary special? I'll kind of factor that in insofar as if something feels particularly celebratory, that will kind of be like extra credit in its favor. But if it's not, I'm not going to count that against it. So the fact that this doesn't really feel like a special is not in and of itself damning, but the fact that this just feels like a standard, you know, basic episode <laughs> it's just that this is nothing. It doesn't even do anything with the Doctor and Yaz, which it tries to do a little something with, but even that really goes nowhere. This is, this is just vapor. Number 24, Planet of the Dead. This one's also kind of nothing. <laughs> if I'm being honest, really, I think the only reason I'm ranking this one above a Legend of the Sea Devils is I remember the supporting cast better. They left a better impression between Lady Christina D'Souza and some of the uh, folks on the bus. I actually kind of made me go, oh yeah, I do kind of remember you. Malcolm? I remember Malcolm. But the supporting cast in the Legend of the Sea Devils, I, I kind of feel bad for them that we're stuck in that story. But this, like that, is just, this could have been a standard episode. The only reason this is counted is because it, wasn't part of the standard season. So this lands here. I really have nothing to say about this thing. 
Number 23, The Runaway Bride. Here's the first of several placements I'm sure will be quite controversial. Here's the thing. I love Donna, and I also understand why this episode is the way that it is. So, I love Donna. She is one of my favorites. Often I'll put her at the top, or at least very close to it, of my all-time favorite companions. Definitely a modern era, possibly the show overall. The thing is... I don't like her in this. Now, I recognize that as part of her arc. We see her like this so we can appreciate how she's already changed by the time she shows up in Partners in Crime, and then we get to see her change more over the course of Series 4. I appreciate that. It doesn't make it any more enjoyable for me to watch her just scream. In fact, everybody this entire episode is just screaming. The Doctor screams. Donna screams. The Ragnos Queen will not stop screaming. This whole thing is just, it's a cacophony of noise, and I just don't enjoy it. Number 22, The Time of the Doctor. This, uh, this one's a little weird for me. So, I don't inherently have a problem with a more whimsical or fairy tale like style to the storytelling. In fact, I can often enjoy that quite a bit. That'll kind of come up again a little bit later in a more positive way. The thing is, I feel like that style of storytelling is an ill fit for a regeneration story. This just kind of feels like it's meandering through this mishmash of stuff that's like, oh, let's be sure that we touch on all the enemies that we've seen in a while, and oh, we'll throw in some token nods to Christmas, because it's the Christmas special, and I guess we have to acknowledge that in some way, and then we'll end in what is admittedly a good regeneration when we eventually get there, but this doesn't feel like a story that is building to that, or is celebratory of that, or is even really much of a celebration of the 11th Doctor in particular. It's not bad. In fact, there are times that the tone kind of feels nice, but it's just not pulling together. Number 21, The Snowmen. This actually, I maybe could have uh, mentioned this last entry, but uh, I'll mention it now. I actually am not a huge fan of the kind of pantomime-inspired campness that often comes with the Christmas episodes in specific. It's just not my jam. I understand other people like it. I understand that especially UK viewers seem to especially like that. But me, like, it's it's not my thing. So understand that that's going to come up and that's kind of the case here. Oh, it's, it's Christmassy and then there's killer snowmen. Okay. This thing has two things going for it that kept it from being any lower. One, Richard E. Grant, who admittedly doesn't get a ton to do here. It's mostly kind of setting him up to appear later on as the great intelligence where he gets to shine a little bit more, but I still like him as a presence, so that's nice. Second, the governess, Victorian era Clara. I think this is the best version of Clara out of the multiple ones we got. It establishes her so quickly, and she is so well characterized immediately in a way that the Clara that actually traveled in the TARDIS wasn't for a while. This one, I got her right off, and I was immediately on board, like, I like you a lot, and in a way that I just kind of would have really preferred if this was the version of Clara that we got all the way through. Now, like, I, Clara got better later on, and, and I'm not going to go through all that. I've done videos talking about my issues with Clara, none of which have to do with Jenna Coleman. She's incredibly charming in the part, and that is on full proper display here, but really those two performances are, are kind of it for highlights on this one. They're there. There's just not much. Number 20, Voyage of the Damned. The uh, episode from the modern era with the highest viewing numbers. I don't really care for it all that much. Like, I kind of appreciate it as a bit of a riff on, like, the Poseidon Adventure and uh, Titanic and just sort of that kind of disaster story. It's... It's fine as far as that goes. It introduces Wolf, which I really like. Strong performances from the supporting cast. That actually goes a long way towards helping this, but this is one where the uh, the campness and the sort of pantomime feel to it, there's, there's a lot of that on display, especially when Max Capricorn shows up to be the villain of the piece, and I just, I can't with that guy. I can't take him seriously. 
And given the tragedy that we're supposed to feel with some of the deaths of characters, I really think I should have been taking him seriously. There's kind of a mishmash of tones that don't quite work. It's oddly campy and lighthearted while being weirdly dour and brutal. It's, it's, it's an odd mix. Some strong components, but they don't quite blend. Number 19, The Christmas Invasion. So, okay, before you jump down my throat, once David Tennant steps out of the TARDIS and says, did you miss me? And we go from there to the end, gold. Solid gold. Love it. Don't change a thing. Getting there's a little bit of a slog for me. Again, a lot of it has to do with the tone stuff around the Christmas episodes that I just don't especially care for. The the murderous Christmas tree, the Santa robots. Like it's it I get it. I get it. I get why it's there. I get other people like it. I just don't. So I don't really rewatch this episode. I kind of jump ahead to when David Tennant steps out in his pajamas and I'm like, cool, now I can have fun. Number 18, The Next Doctor. This one is largely buoyed on the back of the character of Jackson Lake. That is the titular Next Doctor, a man who believes himself to be the Doctor, but he's not, not really. I like Jackson Lake a lot as a character, not just for, you know, the sense of adventure that he has when he thinks he is the Doctor, though that is fun. But once he gets his own memory back, there is such compassion and I really relate to the performance, especially as he's trying to save his son. And I love towards the end where he's, he's, he steps into the TARDIS and then rushes back out and goes, that's, that's enough. That's quite enough. Like, I adore this man. And I don't, I think it would probably be undermining to the stuff I love about him to ever bring him back. But I like him a lot. And he boosts up a bit a story that is otherwise just kind of... <laughs> You know, we have Cybermen stomping about in uh, in Victorian era England. It is Victorian era. I just use that kind of generi- generically. Is it Edwardian? I don't know. <laughs> Dickensian. I don't know. One of those. One of those Ian uh, eras of of England. And like, it's 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 fine. But he does a lot. I I enjoy him greatly as a one off character. And. That's why this is not lower than uh, than it is, because taking him out, the rest of it's just kind of, okay. Number 17, Revolution of the Daleks. I actually was surprised how strongly the Chris Chibnall uh, sort of Dalek trilogy of um, New Year's specials ended up holding up when I went and rewatched them. Better than I would have expected. This is the weakest of those three, as evident by its placement. Um, it, like, I think bringing in and uh, bringing back the the character of uh, Robertson and, like, I don't know why they felt the need to do that. And there's a little bit of untapped potential. Well, actually, there's a fair bit of untapped potential with the idea of Daleks being used as police and security for the government. There could have been more done with that. But it also does stuff that I like a lot, which is, in fighting between Daleks. I am always here for that. I love Civil War between Daleks. It's like one of my favorite things. And I, I kind of would like Modern Era to do something more with it, something proper with it, because it hasn't really, and I would love it to. But there's also a lot of fun energy from uh, the guest cast. We get some strong supporting uh, performances. We get Captain Jack back. Yes, there are the issues with John Berman. I'm not dealing with that right now. It was just nice to have him back. And the dynamic between the characters, the Doctor and the Companion, was about as um, well, was as much of a well-oiled machine as as it really kind of got during Chibnall's era. So I just, I just enjoyed this one. It's not amazing, but I like it. Number 16, The Doctor, The Widow, and The Wardrobe. Oh, I'm going to take some heat for not putting this one further down. A lot of people really don't like this one. And I think I've even put this on some lower rankings in some earlier lists, like years and years ago. I don't go out of my way to keep my list consistent, if you hadn't guessed. They're a snapshot of what I think at the time I made them. But the thing is, this, as opposed to the time of the Doctor, is where the lighter tone, the sense of whimsy, the sense of almost a fairy tale tone 
actually really works for me. And honestly, it largely hinges on the character of Madge Arwell. A bit like the next Doctor, uh, this is largely made better by her performance, but also I kind of just... I kind of just like and roll with the story. I like the doctor just trying to help these people, especially at a point of his life where he's kind of avoiding the consequences of what he did to his own friends and family, which gets addressed at the end in a way that's also very beautiful. But I, I love Madge as a character. I love her dynamic with her husband. I love the way that the doctor sort of has set up the house and uh, and all these, <laughs> all these things, you know, saying the door has developed a fault. And I... I repaired it and, you know, Im improved the bedroom and all these things. It's just a good time. And I, I, while it doesn't do a ton to really call on Narnia specifically beyond just the title, the Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe, it has that feel and tone really in there. And I enjoy that, especially as a Christmas episode. I know I've said that I don't usually like the tone of the Christmas episodes, but honestly, because it's a lot of times they feel too jokey to me. This just feels whimsical, which isn't quite the same thing. This hits a balance for me better than I think it does for most people. Number 15, Waters of Mars. This is probably another controversial placement because of... Uh, the fact that it's not higher. I know some people swear by this episode, and I tend to think better of it now than I used to. I used to think it was wildly overrated. These days, I think it's just moderately overrated. <laughs> um, but there are definitely some stellar performances in this. This is one of those episodes that has a phenomenal supporting cast. Everybody's pulling their weight and doing great work with their characters. But especially the character of Adelaide Brooke, she's so good. And Tennant's putting a lot of work in too. The thing is, the two main things that people tend to cite when they talk about how much they love this episode are things that I'm just kind of, yeah, okay, on. One being the flood. A lot of people cite them as being uh, especially scary or effective. And while I will grant they are shot and performed in an effectively scary manner, ultimately, for me, they're just, they're zombies. They're water-based zombies. Neat idea functions well, works here, but I, I'm not blown away by it the way I am by something like the Weeping Angels the first time we saw them, or the Vashta Narada, or the Midnight Entity. You know, that's the kind of stuff that gets under my skin and makes me go, oh, dang, and these things never really did that for me. They're fine. And then there's the Time Lord Victorious, which I appreciate more as a step in the Tenth Doctor's own journey leading towards his own regeneration than I do as an actual story beat in and of itself. It's honestly a little bit like my feelings of Donna in The Runaway Bride, where I'm like, I get why this has to be here for her whole arc to work, but I don't love watching it. Think of that, but on a smaller scale. I actually am not bothered by this. I'm just not wrapped up in it as a thing unto itself. I'm just like, okay, cool. That's, we did that step. We'll move forward. So the things that people tend to love about this, I'm just like, those are fine. Honestly, I just really like the uh, the production on this and the, ca and the cast. Supporting cast is great on this. They do a lot. Number 14, Resolution. Really should have been called Resolution of the Daleks. It wasn't, whatever. So this was the first of the Chris Chibnall penned uh, New Year's specials. And I really like some of the stuff in here. There's a couple of bits that I really don't like. I have some issues with how Ryan's father is handled. I think a little bit better on it on a rewatch than I did when I first saw it. But there's also some stuff like uh, an absolutely egregious and deeply unnecessary uh, instance of a barrier gaze uh, trope in here. But... I really like the reconnaissance Dalek. I love the idea of it. I love the way it operates. I love the voice and how it's just wrapped around this woman and puppeting her. Like, I actually really like this thing. And I think this is a really cool extension of an idea of something that certain kinds of Daleks can do. And I like that it's singled out that this is a very specific type of Dalek. So no, they can't all do this, but this one can. And I like that a lot. I think this was a really cool exploration of a of a variant of a Dalek. And this, in a lot of ways, kind of does the core ideas and notions of something like Daleks and Manhattan way better than that did. You want to, like, 
go off and explore some of the oddness and eccentricities of a specific, possibly even unique kind of Dalek. This does it a lot better than that did, and yeah, I enjoy it. Number 13, The Star Beast. This one, uh, I can be prisoner of the moment. I do have a tendency to put stuff that is uh, fairly recent, a little bit high. Their recency bias is a thing. So I wouldn't be shocked if I drop this down to a lower position if I have, if and when I ever do this ranking again. But for right now, this was a wonderful reintroduction of David Tennant as the Doctor, the 14th Doctor of this case, not the 10th. Ah, boy, next time I rank the Doctors, I'm going to have to figure out whether or not to do 14 and 10 separate. My instinct is to do so, but one is just such an extension of the other. Anyways, separate topic. But him coming back and uh, Catherine Tate coming back as Donna, this, I've described it elsewhere as being a warm nostalgic bath. That's exactly what it was. And once the warmth of that nostalgia has cooled for me a bit, I may not think as highly of this one as I do, but I think the Meep story is fun. I mean, I knew the twist because I know what the Meep is and I know what it's from um, originally. So I knew what was coming, but I, it's still fun to see it play out and just to see actors in, in roles that I know they are wonderful in just play. I also actually really like uh, Rose Noble as well. So yeah, this one just made me feel good. <laughs> Number 12, The Church on Ruby Road. This is another one that I, I won't be shocked if in future I drop it down a little lower, but right now it's buoyed up because this is currently the big showcase for Shudi Gatwa's 15th Doctor and also for the new companion of Ruby Sunday. Now, depending on what I feel may or may not be better show pieces for them as characters later, this might drop down um, because it's like, well, yeah, it's a good show piece for them, but we get even better stuff later. So I, but right now at time of doing it, this is all we've got. So I'm inclined to buoy it up because of that. And as far as the rest of it goes, the whole goblins notion, there's a, there's a fun rollicking feel to this thing. It's got a adventure tone overall, but it is really as a as a spotlight, as a presentation of here's these characters, especially for Gatwa as the doctor, it's a really good showpiece for him. I got a sense of his humanity, of his energy, of how much he cares that even though the uh, kind of the whole premise of this particular iteration of the doctor is that he shed a lot of his baggage, that doesn't make him carefree. He cares a lot. And I'll be really curious to see more of that going forward. But since that time of recording, it's the only instance of it we got, I'm inclined to put it here. Number 11, The Return of Dr. Mysterio. This is one that I will readily grant if you don't have a particular attachment to superhero stories in general, and Superman in particular, this one might well bug you. This might bug you in the way that some of the ones I put much lower, they just happen to bug me. But speaking as someone who does like superheroes, and while Superman is far from my favorite superhero, does like a good Superman story, this is a really fun pastiche. And it was an interesting way to sort of pivot from the standard of what we're used to with the Christmas specials overall and giving us this focus on this relationship. Cause like it could have just been in here's our Superman, but it's not just here's our Superman, it's here's our Superman and our Lois Lane. Let's have a real fun dynamic between the two of them. And it is a real fun dynamic. It's a ton of fun. And also uh, bringing in Nardal to start being the companion. He's not quite as good here as he'll be in series 10, but he's certainly better than he was in his first appearance. So that's a welcome addition. The villains are placeholder. I'll grant you that. But seeing Peter Capaldi just play in this very standard superhero kind of story, th this just hits me in, in some good ways. What can I tell you? Number 10, Last Christmas. Christmas as a horror story. There's Santa Claus, but there's also head crabs. 
This should feel like the kind of tonal clash I complained about with episodes like uh, Voyage of the Damned, where like these things don't go together, but somehow here, for me at least, actually these do blend shockingly well, especially when we start getting into the whole idea of these things putting you into a dream state and the dreams within dreams and suddenly stuff like Santa and the Elves, which first of all, right at the right at the front end, Nick Frost is a great Santa and the Elves are adorable. And I just, I love how they're introduced and I love the interactions and it's great. And then it just organically gets weirder and creepier. And I honestly would put this higher if it didn't chicken out on its own ending because the... One, there's like several points which feel like fake out endings, but the one that really could have been that ending with Clara having aged and being far older and being like, I can't keep traveling with you, I'm too old. That would have been a gorgeous ending for Clara. Now, that's not for me to say that there was nothing good that came about with her after, but that was such a good exit point. The fact that they teased it and then went, yeah, but she's not leaving. Here she is young again. Ugh. Like, if you're not gonna give her a real gorgeous sign off like that, then don't tease it. Uh, yeah. That one thing does bring it down probably several slots that otherwise it would have been a bit higher. I still do really like this one, though. Number nine, A Christmas Carol. If you've got something that is sci-fi or supernatural and it runs long enough, eventually it's gonna do its spin on A Christmas Carol. I swear that everything freaking does it eventually. And this is a pretty well done version of that. Michael Gambon was a really good pick for a Scrooge style figure and the doctor being the ghosts, well, all the ghosts of Christmas, past, present, future, etc., and functioning in that role while trying to help this doctor in particular, Matt Smith, he slots in pretty well for that. It also has one of my favorite lines in all of Doctor Who uh, when it is pointed out that somebody is uh, nobody important and Matt Smith says, nobody important. Blimey, that's amazing. You know, in 900 years of time and space, I never met anyone who wasn't important before. I adore that line. I adore that delivery. I adore that line. And this, while I, I will grant is not a particularly unique version of Christmas Carol, it's Christmas Carol with a sci-fi justification as opposed to a supernatural one, but I kind of like spins on a Christmas Carol. So yeah, I, I, I like it. Number eight, The Husbands of River Song. This is another one that if I could chop off just part of it and only have one from a certain point onward, it would be higher. If we started from the point at which um, there is the whole scene where River like slowly realizes that Capaldi is the doctor and he's standing there beside her, there to the end it is gorgeous and heartbreaking, and I absolutely adore it. Getting up to that point, it's it's uh, it's a little rough at times. Nardole is not working well here. I, I, the goofiness that Matt Lucas has in the part works better when it is more tempered, which it is later on. Here it is just on full display. It gets old real fast. And the villain, again, we just have another villain that just shouts a lot. There's still fun to be had just by having Peter Capaldi and Alex Kingston together even before she realizes who he is because they're both great actors and they play off of each other really well. But the front end of this does lean a little bit more into the pantomime kind of stuff that I don't love as much. But I adore the back half of this and I want to put it higher, but because the front end's a little bit of a slog, not as much of a slog for me as something like, say, The Christmas Invasion is, but certainly compared to the back half, yeah, this is where it lands. Number seven, the end of time. I could have broken this up into part one and part two. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna lump them together and just treat it as one thing. What's good here? Wilf, for starters. Bernard Cribbins as Wilf is one of the best companions and he is so phenomenal in this and he carries a lot of this actually. Like Tennant is doing a good job. I'm still not a huge fan of his, hissy fit that he throws, like, I, I get it, I get it. 
but I still don't enjoy watching it. I don't love, uh, I don't want to go. This just isn't the energy I personally tend to enjoy a doctor having in a regeneration moment. I get why it's like this, why, this way and why it's this way for this doctor in particular. I absolutely get it. Still not my favorite thing to watch. But I actually quite like this version of the Master. I actually like him better here than in Series 3. That seems to be an oddly controversial opinion. I don't know why. I just think he works better here. I don't know. <laughs> I just do. And the return of the Time Lords just felt so momentous, especially when you have Timothy Dalton with that voice. <laughs> it's, it's not an easy thing to top bringing the Master back again. That's a way to do it, though. This raises the stakes really well, dabbles in a couple of storytelling things I don't love, <coughs> prophecies, but it is ultimately a culmination of what Russell T. Davis does. And as a way to sign off his original tenure as showrunner, it does that quite well. Number six, The Giggle. So this is another one that, yeah, th there might be a little recency bias here, but there's a few things that I really, really love. First of all, Neil Patrick Harris. He's having so much fun. And because he's having so much fun, I'm having so much fun. And that really does a lot to bolster this along. Really good villains are not as plentiful as you would think with Doctor Who, at least really good villains who are individuals. You know, when we talk whole species, the Cybermen, the Daleks, like, yeah, okay, but like a really strong singular personality, there aren't that many, or not as many as you'd think for how long the show's been going. This, though, uh, this is up there. I enjoy this quite a bit. And I also really like the tension in the relationship between the Doctor and Donna, because this is the first time that they actually slow down and kind of acknowledge what's going on with the Doctor a little bit, which eventually leads us to the bi generation. And if you saw my review of this thing, I, while being skeptical initially and not knowing what the hell to make of it at first, the more I thought about it, especially upon rewatch, I actually really love the bi generation. Not as a thing in and of itself. I actually think it's a wonky idea and possibly a bad one, but for what it enabled to happen, that it enabled us to celebrate the coming of a new doctor in a way that did not necessitate the death of a previous one. And it lets David Tennant's 14th doctor have a very specific happy ending that the doctor otherwise has never been able to have, which is to just retire. Just retire and relax and take care of himself. The doctor doesn't get to have that, but this time he does. And I think that's really, really beautiful. It was fun getting to that point. And while the specific mechanics of it, I'm still very iffy on, and I don't ever want to see it again, but what it gave us, what came out of that is beautiful and I love it. Number five, the power of the doctor. Last episode of the Chris Chibnall era, I tell you, it's weird. This actually works incredibly well as a celebration. Yes, of Doctor Who as a whole, because we get some older stuff. We get multiple older doctors back, multiple older companions back all of which I really enjoyed, like especially, especially Sylvester McCoy and Sophie Allred, the Doctor and Ace together again, that oh, I choked up. But even the fifth Doctor and Tegan, and I don't even really like the fifth Doctor, but that still hit me pretty well. That feels celebratory, but also it feels like a real celebration of the Chibnall era of Doctor Who. So it's odd that I like it this much, given that I don't really like the Chibnall era of Doctor Who. But this is a great celebratory way to end it. I wish it was celebrating something that I had liked more, but as a final blowout, yeah, this is what I like in big spectacle Doctor Who. I don't want Doctor Who to always be big spectacle, but if it's gonna be big spectacle, I dig this. I had a lot of fun with this. It has great energy. I enjoyed Dewan back as the master again. I just really loved the energy everybody brought and all these things that it's touching on, all these little bits from the era, Joe Martin getting one more little bit on screen, all this stuff. If there's a problem, it's possibly that Jodie Whittaker doesn't get as much opportunity to shine as nearly everybody else in it. And 
that's a little odd. But setting that aside, this is just a good time. And I've double checked it. I've rewatched it actually a couple times. It still holds up. I still have fun. Number four, Eve of the Daleks. The final entry in Chris Chibnall's trilogy of Dalek specials, and also the best one. A time loop, which, that's just great. I mean, this, this is Groundhog Day with Daleks. I like time loops in general, and Doctor Who has not done them very often, actually. But I think it's well deployed here. I like the additional factor that the time loop is getting shorter every time. So you have that sense of repetition that you get from a time loop and the fun that comes with that without it taking the stakes out because they're running out of time to figure out how to deal with this whole thing. There are honestly good jokes in this. There's some stuff about the dynamic of the two main guest characters that I'm not always fully on board with, but they do well enough, and it landed a little bit better on a rewatch than it did on first impression, but they're still not great um, in terms of the way the those two characters play off each other and the way that dynamic is built, but that is thankfully a pretty small part of the episode overall. It's about outrunning Daleks and then getting killed by Daleks and then time goes back and you run, and then you run again and you get killed again and yeah. I, it's deceptively simple but shockingly effective. Number three, Twice Upon a Time. This is not only a special but a story of Doctor Who in general that's been creeping its way up in my estimation over time. Because uh, upon first watching, I remember thinking like, the Doctor Falls would have been a better place to have the regeneration. And I'm not even necessarily going to say I backpedaled on that, but what I appreciate about this is as a coda, as a denouement, as a way of easing this Doctor into his gener regeneration instead of going out on the climactic moment. There's nothing wrong with ending on the climax, but having a moment to calm down, take your breath, and in this case, have him look into something that he thinks is a danger, but in fact isn't. It's benevolent. It's caring. And for him to realize that and to pair that with the Christmas armistice is actually really beautiful and a really lovely way to integrate Christmas in a way completely different from how the show had done it up to that point. The speech that Capaldi gives leading up to his regeneration, I really like this keeps growing on me and I get a good feeling when I watch it. If there's an issue, it's that the depiction of the first Doctor is a little wonky, um, but that doesn't drag it down for me. It could have been better, and maybe this would have been even higher, but I still like this. Number two, Wild Blue Yonder, the weird one, out of the recent Doctor Who specials that we had, and yeah, I like when Doctor Who gets weird. I like midnight. I like it takes you away. I like strangeness. And this, this is well done, creeping, dread kind of strange. I love that it's basically a two-hander. It's David Tennant and it's Catherine Tate, and that's basically it. I mean, at the end, we have our final appearance of Bernard Cribbins as Wilf, and that's also really nice. But this, the bulk of this is just the two of them technically playing two parts. The not things are a great concept, really well executed for the most part, little wonky CGI. But other than that, it's a really great idea in the sense of what is going on and all the interactions that happen when they are trying to suss out, is one of these people I'm talking to, is that not who it looks like? And the ways that they that they figure that out are clever and interesting. But even before you get to the cleverness, just the nature of what comes out of those interactions is such good character work. This is a phenomenal example of telling a really tense, interesting, propellant story while while pretty much seamlessly integrating character beats, characterization, wonderful interactions. It's just so neatly woven together. It's great. And number one, the day of the doctor. I said that 
that sense of celebration kind of works as extra credit. In a lot of ways, it's what buoyed Power of the Doctor up as high as it got. And it's definitely on display in this. This isn't perfect. I don't think any of these are. I kind of would have liked something that felt like a bigger, proper highlight for the War Doctor, but this does feel celebratory. Not just of the, of the modern era of Doctor Who by bringing two Doctors together in the form of David Tennant and Matt Smith, but also the whole idea of what's happening and what it's building to. The reinforcement of who the Doctor is, and more importantly, who the Doctor isn't, and who the Doctor should never be. And that's not necessarily like a condemnation of what RTD did with his implications about the time war. I don't think Moffat's doing that, but I think Moffat is looking at that and going, okay, if a doctor did what it is implied uh, the doctor did to end the time war, that would have to be someone who doesn't even consider himself the doctor. Thus, we have the war doctor. And in a case of having your cake and eating it too, creating a version of the doctor that kind of allows it to not fully taint other iterations of the Doctor, but also to have the realization for both him and for us, he didn't do it. He didn't do the horrible thing that he'd been carrying with himself for so long. He thought he did. We thought he did. But he didn't. Because he wouldn't. The Doctor wouldn't. And the thing is, the Time War hadn't really bugged me. But the revelation of the story was me realizing, yeah, he wouldn't do that. So finding a way to address that and to bolster and reinforce the compassion of the Doctor and to have it run and in parallel and interweave with this story of the Zygons and this notion of having to find a way uh, to live with each other, having to find a solution to an impossible situation. And also, that first initial look at Capaldi, just the eyebrows. <laughs> this just has all the good feels coming together. And that, and towards the end, where we get clips of all the other doctors, this notion that every iteration of him is coming together to just ensure that he doesn't have to do it. He doesn't have to become a monster. He saves himself. All versions swoop in to save him from himself. And I also really, really like Billy Piper as the bad wolf entity. I love that thing. <laughs> it's, it, again, I like weird, and that thing's weird, and I like it a lot. Day of the Doctor. I think it's the best special that Doctor Who has done in the modern era. What do you think? How would you rank these? How upset are you for me putting something that you like down low or putting something you don't like up high? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments and let's talk about it. Patreon pays the bills, enables me to do this as my living, even if you can't help me out that way. Like, share, and subscribe. Those all help me out. Don't worry too much about it though. What I really want you to remember, we're in a new year now, and just keep in mind, you are beautiful, you are valid, and you are loved. You are the council. I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. Time for me to thank my highest supporting patrons. Robin Moore, Zubin Lafula, Goddess Elida, Oliver B, Tarak, The Thing That Goes Doink in the Anime, Ruth, Goes with the Gazarian, Solitary Pictures, Ulrich Bogdan, Geek Filter, Melinda Walters, Toku BL Hubian, Jen, Auntie Kate 808, Becky Sparks, Renabi Likes the Poodle, Robin Powell, T Love, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casperl, Dave Hall, Quite Bearish, Rosalind Bennett, Pal Barabad Jagal. I'm sorry for whatever butchery I did to that, and Mira G. I know I've kind of done like funky stuff saying them the last few times. I had this whole idea where I was gonna like sing them to the tune of Carol of the Bells, but then I realized it's gonna like clash with my outro music and I didn't really wanna rework that or just cut the outro music out altogether. That felt weird, so I just, I just didn't, I just didn't, I just didn't do a thing this time. But now I've told you that I didn't do a thing. So I've made a thing about there being 
No thing. Okay. Thanks for sticking around. Bye.